you do three years of internal medicine, then you do three years of pulmonology and critical care combined fellowship, and then you do an additional one year of interventional pulmonology. So mm -hmm. seven years total after graduation from medical school. Hello, Ish Harrowing. Hello, hello, hello. I'm excited for you to be here. Um, uh, what's going on? We're going to talk about some interventional pulmonology today. Whether, whatever that is, we're going to learn all about it today. I'm excited to uh, bring on our guest, Dr. Abdelghani here in one second. Let me see if I can find him. Dr. Abdelghani, if you are here, raise your hand and I can uh, bring you on as a panelist to join me. Hello there. I see you. Uh, there we go. All right. So excited. As, as Dr. Abelgani is joining us, uh, say hello. Where are you watching? Where are you watching from? Uh, and what specialty are you potentially interested in in the future? Let's get that chat going uh, so we can see who's here watching. Minneapolis, future OBGYN. We're going to change your mind. Minnesota, ortho bro or gal. <laughs> Hamilton, Canada. They have doctors in Canada. That's really cool. Um, let's see. Dr. Abdel Ghani, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well, man. How are you? Y'all hear y'all can hear me, I guess. I can hear you. Awesome. 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 Let's I don't see any pulmonologists, future pulmonologists uh chiming Not in here. Shame. Are we gonna change that? Shame. I think so. <laughs> We're gonna talk about interventional pulmonology. Yeah. So Dr. Ramsey Abdelghani, when did you first realize, like, hey, I like lungs? Yeah, I think I was a med student, and I was kind of torn. It's weird. I was kind of torn between nephrology, that someone just shouted out, and pulmonology. I liked internal medicine. I liked the complexity of everything. And then I did a rotation in nephrology and pulmonology in the area when I was a med student. And I mm -hmm. really fell in love with pulmonology. I had a few CF patients that are really cool some ILD patients that were very interesting. And then, and I also rotated in the ICU and that was awesome. Yeah. So when I did internal medicine residency, I gravitated, I was always in the ICU. I actually asked for extra months in the ICU, which is just painful, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> and uh, love doing bronchoscopy and all that kind of stuff. And then I, you know, matched into pulmonary and critical care. And I found myself always in the Bronx suite. I would yeah. kind of do my night shift in the ICU or whatever. If it was a slow night, I had a few extra hours. I'd come at 7 a.m. to the Bronx suite, do a few Bronx, go home, sleep, and try to repeat as much as possible. Yeah. What was it about bronchoscopies that you liked? Was it just, do you, do you like the the game feature of like, <laughs> ooh, I'm driving down the road here? Do you like like the immediate, like, oh, I pulled a, a PE out of this person. Now they can breathe. Right. Um, what what was the the satisfaction there? I mean, all above, man. They're they're cool procedures. They're quick for the most part. I'm not doing a six hour surgery or something like that. So <laughs> kind of it yeah. uh, plays to my ADD a little bit. You know, I can kind of do back to back cases. The lungs are really cool. The anatomy was very fascinating to me. It's harder than it looks, which is also great. The challenge of it was really nice. And the more I learned about the cool things you could do that I didn't know existed, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Like what? What are some cool things that you didn't know existed? Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of, there's like endobronchial valves. We can put in valves in a patient who can't breathe very well. Instead of lung volume reduction surgery, you can put in valves in their airways and they can breathe better. And it's reversible. It's minimally invasive. No it's surgical like, It's downtime. like peeping themselves with a valve? A little bit. So it's a one-way <laughs> valve where air comes out of the lungs and doesn't go yeah. back in. So that lung selectively oh. collapses. So you get increased or benefit in mechanics. If in patient with COPD, you have too much air in your chest. And you just can't take a deep breath. And this helps fix that. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's all in. We'll talk about it. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. Um, what what traits do you think make a, a good interventional pulmonologist? Uh, you have to, I mean, any, any proceduralist, you have to be, you know, I guess, okay with waiting, right? You're waiting for your mm -hmm. case to go. You're waiting for your case <laughs> to be ready, things like that. Additionally, just being good with technology, I think, being interested in that field and being able to 
you know, being good with your hands, right? I mean, the video game aspect is definitely real, I feel. Yeah. I played video games a ton as a kid, and now I feel like I scratched that itch a little bit. <laughs> I work all day, you know? It's, yeah. it's, honestly, I wake up excited. I'm like, oh, I got a cool nodule case today, or I got a cool rigid bronchoscopy case today, and I end up being, you know, like I, it's not, you know, something for me to look forward to, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. When, when you talk about being good with your hands, uh, I ask all of the proceduralists or surgeons this, uh, how much of that do you think a person has to come in being really good with their hands versus it, you're basically a technician and, and you learn the trade through training? I think more often than not, you can learn the trade. I, I always tell my fellows, the more bronchoscopy you do, the better you're going to be. I've done yeah. thousands, I'm going to be better than they are when they've done 10 right? Yeah. Again, there is some innate skill to it, but I don't think that can't be overcome. Yeah. Yeah. But then, you awesome. know, we have simulation centers. We have, you know, just getting more time in the Bronx, we, whatever procedure you want to do. I think the more you do it, the better you are. Yeah. That's anything in life. I, I try to teach my eight-year-old. She gets frustrated at something. I'm like, you're eight years old. Like it's going to take a while to, to learn how to uh, suture uh, a mattress stitch. Come on, kid. Um, <laughs> That's a great quality uh, so, half for her though. You know, she wants to get better and she wants to get better quick. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. They uh, it's, it's fun. So the, the day in the life uh, yeah. of an interventional pulmonologist. That, to me, those words sound very much like you're hospital-based. You're not out in the community at a clinic. What, what does that world look like for you? No, absolutely. Yeah. So really, because you do a lot of advanced procedures, it's not the day-to-day -day kind of stuff that most general pulmonologists can do. You kind of tie it to a large academic or a large cancer center that has a high influx of patients. So you end up seeing these patients who you're diagnosing lung nodules and, and small lung nodules to, to catch cancer early. You are, you know, God forbid the, the patients have you know, recurrence of their disease or progression of their disease. And a lot of times the tumors can invade the airways and you can kind of core them out essentially and help them breathe a little better. If not, you're not curing the disease, but you're also, but you're palliating them and having them have an improvement in their quality of life, you know? Yeah. So a lot of times you, you're kind of stuck to a large academic center, which is, I enjoy, I like being, kind of the top at the food chain kind of thing. I like being the, the person to come, you know, people ask for help. If that makes yeah. sense. I find that enjoyable. Yeah. You you like that uh, very specific niche that you found where you're the expert and people are coming to you for that. Yeah, it, it's cool. And, and I'm also an ICU doc. So, I mean, I like the ICU is kind of the top as well, where people, mm -hmm. the sickest get to go there and you can try your best to, you know, do your best for them. And if not, then not much else can be done. Who doesn't do well in an ICU in terms of, of physician wise? Like, uh, the, is it like the pressure of people like on death's door, uh, uh, doorstep? Um, because I'm sure you see students coming through training or even residents of like, I just, sure. the ICU is just not for me. Like, who is that person? If you're interested in the outpatient clinic lifestyle, then ICU is not for you. If you like to take your time, read through every single detail, <laughs> ICU may, I mean, I see that's great for an ICU doctor, but initially you yeah. have to be able to say, okay what fire is burning the brightest right now? Let me mm. put that out next. What's the next most dangerous fire going out? I'll put that one out. And you keep working your way down to get to something not as, I mean, that may cause, cause them harm in 10 years, which is not yeah. the focus on your ICU stay. Yeah. You know, and that can be done as an outpatient in primary care clinic or something like that. You, you have to be comfortable with the uh, process of triage. <laughs> like, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Going. What, what is going to make them the worst right now? I have to fix that right now and then yeah. <laughs> work my way backwards yeah <laughs> you can't be the person just but yeah they they have a bunion we should probably <laughs> we should probably refer them to podiatrist like no like that's not gonna that kill them podiatry console <laughs> right now we'll be very happy <laughs> that they cause them to trip and like hit their head and get a subdural and end up right back you know that's right um, that's right yeah that's that's fun that's fun okay so uh, in terms of training, and then we'll jump in. I know you have a, a presentation for yeah. us. Uh, in terms of training to become you, what does that look like? So it's probably longer than most people want to do, like schooling-wise. <laughs> but after medical school, obviously, all you guys are interested in that, doing great with that. But you do three years of internal medicine. Then you do three years of pulmonology and critical care combined fellowship. And then you do an additional one year of interventional pulmonology. So mm -hmm. seven years total after graduation from medical school. Okay. So a while. It's a, it's a good bit. Sure. <laughs> Is it worth it? 
I, I think so. I'm not, I couldn't imagine myself doing much else, honestly. I really enjoy it. And uh, I'm fortunate to be where I am, you know, got, got very lucky along the way. Some hard work and some luck gets you there, but I'll, I think I'd do it again for sure. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I know you got a presentation. You want to jump into that? Yeah. Let me try to share my screen and see how this works. Sure. Let me know how that goes. Got it. Do you see? Yeah. All right. Good deal. Nice. I got it on the first try. I'm happy. <laughs> All right. Good deal. Well, yeah, I'm, this is super cool. I've never, you know, I looked up your YouTube stuff and everything. It was really interesting. And I thought it'd be a great to kind of do and really fun to do. So hopefully, hopefully it goes well. See how yeah. it goes. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of talk to you guys to kind of give more information about interventional pulmonology. And it's not a, it's a pretty new uh, specialty, I guess. It's been around the past 10 or 15 years. And people have been doing these procedures, but now we have a combined specialty to encompass all these procedures. And as technology gets better and better, we're kind of on the forefront of that from the lung space, at least. So kind of we talked about a little bit. We use, you know, employ mainly minimally invasive procedures, doing trying to diagnose, uh, you know, respiratory and disease and malignancies and diagnostic and therapeutic bronchoscopic and plural techniques. We take a little bit from ENT's toolbox, anesthesiology's toolbox, thoracic surgery, and general pulmonology. And mainly kind of where I focus are patients who are non-surgical candidates. I mean, if the patient can get the tumor resected or they can get the lung resected or, or get surgical intervention, usually that is the best benefit. If their patients are not surgical candidates for one reason or another, it's a good place for me to come in and do things in a minimally invasive way, safer to get a similar outcome without having to go through the rigorous uh, surgical recoveries. So kind of real quick, my typical week, as you can see, it's kind of back and forth. I do a lot of procedures. It's what I like to do. It's what I try to do. So Monday, I kind of start at 7 a.m. and do as many procedures as I can get away with. Usually I run around 3 p.m. or so because I am in an academic um, facility. And then I'll do some academic, you know, I'll do some research and things like that, do some conferences, write some papers if I can, meet with industry reps. Tuesday, I have a half day of clinic and then administrative time in the afternoon, Wednesday and Friday, more procedures, and Thursday, I have an afternoon clinic. And mostly my clinic is lung nodules, pleural effusions, patients with narrowing in their airways, or with really bad COPD, really bad asthma, really bad uh, chronic bronchitis. And I'll see all those patients try to set them up for a procedure, or after a procedure, I'll see them in clinic as well. So we talked about how did I, how did I get here? I did my residency in Baton Rouge for three years in internal medicine. I went to Tulane for my pulmonology and critical care fellowship. I really, really loved uh, interventional pulmonology. I had a great mentor there who helped me do research and kind of helped me get a leg up. I applied and fortunately got accepted at uh, Harvard for interventional pulmonology. It was a combined program, Mass General and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. So man's that was greatest. Uh, <laughs> man's greatest hospital. That's man's true. greatest hospital. There you go. My, my wife did her, her neurology residency at Man's Greatest Hospital. So it's a. Uh, it's a great place. It was very rigorous, but it was good, oh, yeah. good training. And I was very fortunate to be there. Very lucky. R rigorous, I think, is putting it mildly. <laughs> it was a lot, but it was only one year. A lot of time. But what I've heard multiple times is you can do anything for a year. And that was true. Yep. <laughs> so some of the wide array of things we treat. Uh, a lot of times, again, we talk about being uh, in lung cancer, diagnosing lung nodules, diagnosing lung cancer, treating lung cancer, doing palliation if their the treatment has progressed or their, their disease progressed. Severe COPD, emphysema, we can put endobronchial valves or uh, bronchial rheoplasty and some other trials that are coming down the road. Persistent asthma, you have uh, bronchial thermoplasty. Excessive dynamic uh, central airway collapse, we can put stents and refer them to surgery for surgical uh, fi uh, fixing of uh, essentially or, uh, of that uh, disease. You have a lot of fistulas, holes in things, right? Tracheoesophageal fistula, we can put stents and help work with GI to get that repaired. Bronchopleural fistulas and alveolar pleural fistulas. There's a hole in the lung. We can put valves. We can do things to help close that hole up so the patient can go home. Uh, hemoptysis, if you're coughing up a lot of blood, usually we're one of the first people you call. We want to stabilize, localize the hemoptysis, work with our interventional radiology colleagues or thoracic surgery colleagues for actual definitive management. But you're not going to get too far if you're still bleeding in the lungs. By the time you, you, won't, like, you won't be able to get anywhere without stabilization. Uh, lung nodules is a Definitely a passion of mine. I like uh, biopsying small lung nodules, and I'll go into detail a little further to diagnose uh, lung cancer early on to increase their you know chances of being cured. 
Uh, central airway obstruction. If you have any kind of narrowing in your airways, I'm really the lung plumber. I'll open up that narrowing <laughs> up, you know. If it's something stuck there, I'll take it out. If there's a pee or uh, some change, some people swallow the quarter, or inhale the quarter, I'll take it out. Not a problem. Uh, tracheal stenosis, again, after intubation, you can have narrowing of your upper airway. I can uh, make little cuts and open that up with a balloon to help you breathe better. Uh, again, ILD, chronic bronchitis, pleural diseases, and pneumothoraces we can all help with. That's a, so lot, a lot of stuff. That's yeah, a, it's a, a lot of stuff. A lot of it's a lot stuff. Of, yeah, a lot of cool stuff we can do, I feel. And yeah. uh, we have a lot of cool tools that we use and a lot of tools. So I kind of want to go through some of the stuff we use. If this is interesting to you, maybe a field for you. Thank you. Hey, Ram course, Ramsey, real quick, I, I have to run upstairs for two seconds. You keep rocking. I'm just going to shut my video off for a second. Sounds good. <laughs> Bye. All right. So, uh, so. Uh, other things we can, uh, our workhorse essentially is a flexible or a rigid bronchoscope. We have a lot of tools, the heat and cold therapy we can we can deploy through that. Argon plasma coagulation, electrocautery, a cryoprobe, a laser, all the kind of debulk and open up airways. Navigational bronchoscopy is like a lung GPS. Essentially, we navigate through the airway to try to get to a small nodule and biopsy it. Endobronchial ultrasound is a... Um, it's an ultrasound at the end of a bronchoscope, and we can actually biopsy lesions and biopsy uh, lymph nodes in the mediastinum outside of the airway, through the airway. Endobronchial valves, we briefly mentioned, and a chest tube or a thoracoscopy we can also do, and I'll go into that in the next couple of slides. So our workhorse is the uh, rigid bronchoscope. Its design has not changed in many, many years. It's basically a long steel pipe. We use that to gain optimal access and stabilization of the patient's airway. It has, it's a large lumen, so we're able to, to deploy multiple tools through that lumen. You can use it for central airway obstruction with coring or getting that tumor out or direct dilation using the barrel of the rigid to dilate the narrowing in the, in the lungs or the upper airway. Uh, foreign body extraction, it's a large lumen, so we're able to get big things out. I've had people uh, aspirate, I think, 37 cents in change assorted. We were able to get all that out. They've had, obviously, food, things like that, a dental bridge, I just like the teeth, like fake teeth they aspirated, which is very, very interesting and difficult to get out, actually, because of the shape of it. Uh, massive hemoptysis, the patient's bleeding from the lungs. They really do want us to get the, uh, stabilize the airway and stop the bleeding or at least tampon on the bleeding so they can get to a uh, definitive management. And again, a bunch of tools can go through the, the, the uh, barrel of the rigid and we can place a very some uh, array of stents through that barrel. This is a quick video. I don't know if you guys are squeamish or not, but you're all doctors and pre-doctors, so it should be okay. We're doing a rigid intubation here. So what happened is the anesthesiologist will put the patient to sleep. And instead of them securing the airway, I will secure the airway. You go and pass the tongue. This is with that rigid bronchoscope, you uh, evaluate or locate the epiglottis. This is me as a fellow, so I'm not doing the best job, but I'm doing okay. You <laughs> elevate that epiglottis and you visualize the vocal cords. You take the bevel of the rigid, turn it to the one direction. I turn, I'm turning mine to the right to engage the vocal cords. So you're able to fit that large barrel through the cords. We'll get through the cords pretty cleanly, put the barrel on the posterior membrane to make sure you protect that. And now you can put your tools through with the camera and multiple different things to kind of do the case that you want to do essentially. So I get to do that all day. And I, I think that's pretty cool. Pretty so, awesome. so rigid, uh, doing that rigid bronch for an airway, you wouldn't, would you do it just for an airway? Or are you doing other stuff at the same time? I'm doing a lot of stuff through it. So I'm okay. basically I'm, I'm securing the airway because it's a very large inner channel. And yep. if I threw a normal ET tube or endotracheal tube, you can't fit all my tools in there. So yeah. having the large barrel makes it a lot easier for me to put a bunch of stuff in there and do a bunch of more complex things. Yeah. So you have to have a lot of buy-in from anesthesia and make sure that they're comfortable with this kind of procedure. Obviously, it can be very scary for them because they run the airways, right? That's their, that's their territory. So some of the stuff we can do, uh, some of the ways to debulk tumors, burn tumors, stop bleeding is uh, ablation techniques. One of them is argon plasma coagulation. It shoots out argon gas, which then gets electrified and goes to the path of least resistance, kind of where uh, uh, basically where the, uh, uh, the tissue is. You can see a picture of it here, kind of shooting out from the, the probe that goes out of the bronchoscope to tissue. You can use that to coagulate. You can use that to ablate tissue. Another way to do the, just the same thing is a, a laser. We have multiple kinds of lasers we can deploy, but uh, most of them are, very, are, are, uh, are, are 
are able to coagulate and ablate and have different varying depths of penetration. So you have to be aware of knowing all the different kinds of um, depths so of penetration for the stuff. You, you literally are like playing a video game. You're like it's, Halo leveling up. Like I got the bigger laser now. <laughs> I don't want to tell everybody about this, but yeah, it does seem like kind of what it is all day, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you make noises too? You're like pew, 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 pew. I, they, they told me to stop. My, my, my team is like, okay, you, ha you have to be an adult in the, in the pump suite. You can't. You can't. <laughs> As a fellow, though, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the other side, we have debulking techniques. And this is cryo. It's essentially a freezing probe. It uses a Jules-Thompson effect. I think it's rapidly ex expanding gas, lowers the temperature very quickly, makes it freeze. And essentially, you're getting lung popsicles out, right? I go and I freeze something, and I pull it out. And I either debulk piecemeal or get different pieces from tumor or things like that. I can send those to pathology. And if you can diagnose the cancer or whatever this is, and I can also recannulize the airway using this technique. And that's the probe on the bottom. And it goes through the working channel of our bronchoscope as well. If you're more old school, you don't have to use any of those fancy things. You can just use the blade of that rigid. You go to the tumor, you take the bevel, like you see in B, and C, you spin the bevel around the tumor. It cuts the tumor off. You grab the tumor out, take it out. And then if you want to coagulate with argon plasma or anything else, you can coagulate. So you can kind of it also, also cuts down the time of the procedure significantly. So if they're amenable to that, you can just kind of quickly take it out. This is a quick little video. Uh, it's a 35-year-old lady. She was a marathon runner, but she couldn't run marathons anymore. And we got a CAT scan from an outside hospital, showed a small endobronchial lesion. This is us doing a, bronch a bronchoscopy to airway exam. We're in the left That's lung. so right cool. Now. Left lower lobe right here. And then we're going to go to the right. This is in the trachea. We're going to the right. You see something there, but forget about that for now. This is a red upper lobe. That's the apical anterior and posterior segments. This is the endobronchial lesion. So this is highly vascular in the right. This is the bronchus intermedius. So this was, uh, you know, causing her difficulty breathing. Obviously, she was very healthy and obviously very fit. So what we end up doing is using electrocautery snare. We snared around it and pulled and cut it off and took it out and then used argon plasma to coagulate it. This actually turned out to be a carcinoid tumor. And because Wait, they had good outcomes, we referred her to a surgeon. They did resection of that stalk and everything, and she was cured. Wow. She felt much he, better, yeah. A, an electrocautery snare, is that what you called it? Mm -hmm. So nice. like GI has those as well. If you, I think you all had another guest who was a GI doc. And what they mm -hmm. can do is essentially it's like a little lasso or a loop. You put it around, yeah. and as you tighten it, you push a pedal, and the pedal gives electrocautery and just slowly cuts and coagulates that stalk. And then it pops nice. off, you grab it, and you pull it out of the ridge. It's like that's why the woman's so lasso of truth. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Tell me. So, so that little nodule right there mm -hmm. uh, is what? That's the, is that even a centimeter? Uh, probably about, about 10, 11 millimeters because the, the BI is roughly around that depending on the age and height and everything and gender. Yeah. So, yeah. so that small of a thing would cause difficulty breathing. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's pretty, pretty much besides the right upper lobe, that's kind of blocking off her entire right lower lung and right middle lobe as well. So wow. she's breathing, but when she gets really, you know, strenuous, she's obviously not able to move as much air as she needs because she's a marathon yeah. runner. Had she been not as healthy or fit, she probably wouldn't have noticed to have gotten bigger and almost nearly occluded, actually, is what I would assume at least. So exercise saved her life. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. We caught her early and we're able to get it out. It's not a very aggressive tumor to begin with, so she, she did well. Wow. And and when you are when you're in uh, the tubes like this, do you have something externally that tells you where you are, or you just kind of know based on anatomy where you're? Uh, I just do a bunch of these. Yeah, I just know yeah. based on anatomy. I can tell you which segment and subsegment we're going into. And, also and there's to know that. there's not enough variation that you've seen that's like, uh oh, this is I don't I'm lost. I mean, uh, rarely. So if the fellow's yeah. bronching or something and, and they go somewhere without me looking, I can't tell just one airway without knowing how I got there. If I know how I got there, then 100% I'm not confused. But sometimes okay. they, when I'm not looking or I'm doing something else, they'll go somewhere. I'll have them back up just so I get reoriented. Okay. That's so cool. these are some endobronchial stents we can place inside patients, essentially kind of like cardiac stents. Uh, to kind of keep the lumen open if they have external or internal compression or obstruction. We have many kinds. A lot of times they come in uh, certain kinds of metal alloys. Our most common is nitinol and uh, silicone. The ones with studs on them are the silicone stents. We can place these uh, 
for you know many many months at a time, depending on the patient, revise them and uh, exchange them as needed as well. So, so Harry just asked a, a clarifying question about mm -hmm. the the question that I had asked. So there's there's no uh, imaging outside that you're looking at. Uh, you're looking at a screen, obviously, as you're doing this. Correct, correct. And I'm I'm looking at a CAT scan before the procedure to plan my procedure. I saw okay. a little blip in the CAT scan. I'm like, okay, that's where the the the, the you know the something is. It could be blood, okay. mucus, tumor, whatever. Okay. But really, I just kind of just do my exam and use the scope. It's got pretty HD, so it's not bad. You can see. Yeah, so so if there's a known lesion, you have some anatomy that you're going off of uh, versus an exploratory bronch where you're just kind of going and looking around. Correct. When we start most of our bronchoscopies, we do an airway exam. That way, if something abnormal mucosa, something not obvious on a CAT scan, a lot of times we'll find something biopsy, and it could be a precancerous lesion, kind of like GI does, but we don't do screening bronchoscopy like GI does see you know screening colonoscopies we don't do that yeah they just like colons they just like I want to be in the colon all day long all day I'm the, <laughs> if I'm in the colon it's a very big problem I don't know how I got there very lost <laughs> so blame the fellow <laughs> yeah at all times right absolutely that's the joy of being an that's a weird fistula how do, how do <laughs> <that> do? <laughs> uh so, so this is this is a guy He's very interesting. He was, uh, I think he was in his fifties, had progressive shortness of breath, went to an outside hospital. They got a chest X-ray. You can see here, the right lung is completely opacified. There's something blocking right here. It's either blood, mucus, or uh, a tumor. And so we, we took him for a bronchoscopy with rigid bronchoscopy. This is a representative CAT scan coronal view. This is something we call the cutoff sign. You can see the airway of the right main stem is completely cut off. Mm -hmm. You really can't see anything else past that. So we had to go investigate and see what's in there. Uh, quality's not great, sorry, but this is the right main stem, kind of that same area the uh, other thing was. Someone said he can't see the screen. Is that better? I'm not sure. No, uh, we we can see. I, there's something with his. Okay. He, he may have the wrong setting or something. Gotcha. You can see. Perfect. Uh, so the right main stem had complete occlusion. We ended up uh, using cryo debulking, the rigid core, and an APC. And we're able to recannulize and put a stent, as you can see there. Now the uh, the distal airways are all open, and the patient can breathe better. He was on significant oxygen, and after the procedure, he was uh, on room air. For that. And this is another picture of the kind of the left main stem on the left, and the right main stem on the right, and the stent in there, keeping things open. This what? is his chest X-ray after the procedure. So remember that opacification yeah. that was there. He's much better now. He can breathe. He still has cancer. Obviously, we diagnosed him with cancer at that time. Okay. He's able to get treatment and able to tolerate treatment because now he can breathe better. Yeah. Was it was it cancer outside of the airways, just compressing the airways, or was it cancer like in the linings of the airways? It was both, actually. That's a great question. Okay. So there's ways to classify it as extrinsic, just pushing from the outside, like you said. Mm -hmm. Intrinsic is only having, you know, like, like that carcinoid tumor, only having lesion inside it. And there's mixed where it's outside and eats through the airway wall. Those are mm -hmm. always the most challenging, but, you know, you, you, know, you got to get it done. Yeah. That's this cool. is another lady. Yeah, this is another lady from. Um, she had a critical airway stenosis. She had, like you were talking about, she had a mixed disease, cancer on the outside, also growing in. This is her trachea. Normally, your trachea is around 15 millimeters, plus or minus a few millimeters. This is around three. So she was actually on BiPAP, non-invasive ventilation, that mask, and on 100% oxygen. They transferred her over. They're worried about intubating her. We were able to go in with again a rigid bronchoscopy at that time. You could see this is the airway. This is, here is all the narrowing you can see. And all that abnormal mucosa is just tumor eroding through her airway and her trachea. So obviously if that closes up, she obviously can't breathe. We're able to kind of, she was also coughing up blood and everything because of the friability of the, of the tumor. We're able to burn all that stuff away and place a stent. And this is a stent, this is the same airway after the stent. So you can see much, much larger. She was able to um, get off of BiPAP, get off of oxygen, go home with her family. She had extensive disease. So again, I wasn't curing anything, but she was mm -hmm. able to go home and live another three or four months with her family yeah. where had she not had this procedure, she would have to either be intubated in the ICU and probably never leave the ICU, unfortunately. In the, able to give her some of her life back, you know? Yeah. In, in the cardiovascular world, there there is uh, kind of somewhat immediate stent failure 
uh, kind of recoagulation or whatever ar around the stent. Is, is that an issue in, in the airways once a stent's put in? Can anything happen to that stent? I, obviously, a anything can fail, but kind of known immediate issues post stent. Uh, so it can. The good news is we have the we have the the benefit of being able to see. Okay, Cardiologists obviously have to go on fluoro because it's much yeah. more challenging, right? And they have a little wire that they're. I have a larger lumen to work with, but mm -hmm. a lot of times what happens is you have those little cilia on your on your airways that massage and move mucus up, and then you cough it up. The stent covers those cilia and those hairs. So unfortunately, what happens mm. a lot of times, a stent gets can, can get plugged with mucus. So okay. we give them a mucus clearance techniques, you know, nebulizers, mucinex, things like that to keep that stent clean and moist. That way to decrease that chance. Yeah. And someone asked, uh, are, are they typically permanent or can some cases when it, it can be removed? So this is, this is the opposite of cardiology. These, I always tell my patients, we are married until I take that stent out. The stent has to come out. Okay. Either the patient passes with the stent in place or the mm. stent comes out once the treatment improves and the, and the tumor goes away or gets uh, decreased in size. And is that because the, the airways are, are more susceptible to it kind of going through? Yeah, there's a lot of granulation tissue, inflammation, yeah. and the mucus plugging can all be a problem. So really, yeah. it's a risk-benefit kind of thing. Okay. I always take it. I don't take it lightly if I'm going to place a stent or not. Okay. You know, it has to be. A, a ABCs, thing. you're you're first in line, so <laughs> the airway right. come first, That's and we'll deal true. with the rest after. <laughs> yeah, very true, very true. Uh, this is um, so this is another. I thought it was a very interesting case. This is guy with a history of squamous cell carcinoma. He had a left pneumonectomy, so that entire right side on your screen is gone. It's all just everything wow. else. It's no more lung, and then you can see in his in his main airway a big ball. And that's his only airway, obviously, and he has one lung. And he came in as an outpatient, referred from a guy from a few hours away, an outpatient clinic. And he's like, man, aren't you short of breath? How can you be, like, how can you be alive? And he's like, well, when I lay down, I feel kind of short of breath. And the past few months have been more short of breath. And I was very, very impressed. And you can see a sliver of airway going yeah. through that little ball. It's not much to work off of. So it looks like inside, consistent wow. with the CAT scan, you see the sliver of air on the left. And the, the kind of a stalk is kind of pedunculated on the right. So we this, this guy, we used cryo-debulking, tried to use a snare, but it didn't really work for me, and APC. And this is the same airway after uh, removal. So obviously, much improved, right? I think everyone can appreciate that. And then we also did APC on that right side because it was a little oozing, and that was the stalk of the tumor. And this is it six weeks after APC. Wow. So it looks much better. You, can, you almost can't even tell something's in there. Yeah. A and APC again is what? Oh, sorry. Argon plasma coagulation. Oh, the so argon. The ways we can pew, 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 pew. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> pew, pew, pew. Exactly right. This is a, uh, a, a gentleman who had a tracheoesophageal fistula, so communication between his esophagus mm -hmm. and his trachea. Uh, GI at an outside hospital put an esophageal stent, which is the standard of care. Unfortunately, the stents are so large and so powerful that it actually ruptured through the fistula into, this is the airway. So this stent is actually blocking up his airway. Wow. He, again, was on some oxygen, came from ICU to ICU transfer. This is another picture of more close up. They can, that's the esophageal stent piercing through. And what we ended up doing is using a balloon. This is the balloon to push that stent back and it's back to its home. And what better, you know, what better solution to one stent is a second stent. So we put our stent <laughs> right back. My stent better stent. than your yeah. stent. <laughs> to fight back their stent. The patient was able to breathe and they eventually went to surgery to repair that fistula. We took both of our stents out respectively. He did okay. St standard medicine. Be like, you have side effects from your medication? Let me give you more medication. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Beta blocker, how about a beta agonist? <laughs> uh, so I want to kind of, that, those are more therapeutic for malignant disease. I want to get into therapeutic for benign disease. This is uh, the endobronchial valves we were talking about. Uh, so having bad COPD, you essentially have too much air in your chest. I think of it like a roommate who doesn't pay rent, right? They're taking up space, but they're not really doing anything. So patients can't take deep breaths and they're having difficulty taking large deep breaths and getting more and more short of breath. Lung volume reduction surgery, initially you chop out some of that dead lung or bad lung. I don't want to say dead lung. And it'll improve the respiratory mechanics if patients would feel better. Because these patients are so sick, surgery isn't as helpful or it can be a little morbid, at least. I want to say that. 
So we, we, we developed an area uh, away in, in Europe and it kind of came to uh, America to put these endobronchial valves in place. And we do it endoscopically. The nice thing about it is if the patient doesn't do well or doesn't like it or experiences pain or any complication, it's reversible. And uh, you just take the valves out and the airway goes back to the way it was. It does take general anesthesia, but it's a much shorter procedure, about 30 minutes or so. And uh, the patient usually, more often than not, do pretty well. And they have a maybe 20% increased benefit or benefit to their uh, breathing. They feel about 20% better. These are what the valves look like. They are uh, look like little UFOs almost. They have two different companies. And what it does is the valve lets air out of a lung, but not in. So it causes selective atelectasis, where that lung starts to collapse. And then because the lung collapsed, more, you know, the, the, the healthier lung can expand and the diaphragm gets, gets more curved and more physiologic and they're able to breathe better. So it's just, it perfect. just took normal anatomy that's in a vein and you put it in an airway. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. So here we're doing another bronc, of course, and we're going to try to uh, place an endobronchial valve in the right upper lobe. There's some valves. You can see there's a valve right there. We're bypassing the valve going in the posterior segment of the right upper lobe. Skip a little bit. Oh, I went too far. I went way too far. Yeah, there we go. So we have this little catheter that you can see here on the bottom, bottom right of your screen. It's going to load the valve and we're going to deploy it. You want to get this specific valve on a carina, one of the bifurcations of the airways, and then we'll go in and slowly deploy, readjust, and deploy the whole thing. It should be pretty soon. It'll do that. There we go. We're deploying now. So that whole thing popped out from the catheter and that's the one-way valve, that's the duck bill. You can see it open up. When it opens up, air is coming out and it goes right there and air won't go back in. Wow. So this is uh, the kind of a representative CT, a few, you know, at, immediately after the procedure, you can see, you can appreciate the right upper area on the left of the screen has a lot of black, a lot of density, em emphysema and diseased lung. In the middle of six weeks after that right upper lobe is starting to uh, collapse. And 12 weeks after that little cap of white under the ribs is the collapsed right upper lobe. And if you look at the diaphragm on the right, right around here, if you can see my mouse, it's very mm -hmm. flat, unable to flex. Now it's getting more rounded and now it's much more rounded. So the patient can actually start to breathe better. And wow. again, if the patient doesn't like it, it's reversible. You can take it out. You can always revise it if needed. But in, in a non-surgical candidate with not a lot, other, a lot of other options, this can work well in a well-selected patient. And again, uh, with those valves, I'm assuming they come out as well once once you achieve so, what you want. So actually, they stay in lifelong. Do they? Okay. Yep. These are specific valves. We use these valves also for uh, persistent air leak or pneumothorax. Those valves eventually come out after six weeks once the, the hole in the lung is healed. Okay. But these, they stay lifelong, assuming they continue to have continued benefit to the patient. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, can, can, can you get a, a a nice little whistle from those little duckbill valves? No, you don't hear them. Usually what happens uh -huh. is like every exhale, one or two cc's of air comes out nice and slow, nice and slow, and then okay. that's it. You won't hear much. <laughs> it's like so Wheezy cool. from Toy Story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, kind of a the therapeutic standpoint. I want to do kind of quickly, hopefully, some diagnostic things we can do. Now, again, we're mostly diagnosing lung cancer, sarcoidosis, infections in the lungs. We use something called an EBUSCOPE or endobronchial ultrasound dash TBNA, transbronchial needle aspiration. That helps us see the lymph nodes on the outside of the lungs. And we pierce a needle through the airway into those lymph nodes and biopsy them. We have radial EBUS, which is kind of a 360 endobronchial ultrasound, navigational bronchoscopy. We employ cone beam CT in my facility and we can do medical thoracoscopy. I'll talk about all those. So this is what the EBUSCOPE looks like. It's got an ultrasound at the end of it and a needle that comes out. It gives you real-time uh, sampling of these lymph nodes and it's safe and pretty minimally risk compared to surgery. These are all the stations we can get to. I won't, I won't you know, spend too much time on that. That's what, what the pictures kind of look at, uh, look like. That's the, uh, on the, on the left, that lymph node. And on the right is a needle going into the lymph node. You can see the needle coming in from like one o'clock-ish, kind of coming in towards seven o'clock. And you can see real-time acquisition of the tissue we have pathology at bedside who say, it looks like you're in the lymph node. This lymph node looks like cancer. And we can kind of diagnose or stage the lung cancer because staging is very important to treatment of the patient. So we can biopsy the nodule and then biopsy the lymph nodes and see if the tumor has spread. 
I'm a one-stop shop. So radial EBIS is kind of, it comes with the working channel of our bronchoscope. It goes in 360 view. This is a quick little video of what it looks like. So this is inside of our bronchoscope. It, so it spins in 360, so you get a circumferential view. And then we'll, I'm passing it through the bronchoscope after I've navigated to a lung nodule. This is what the lung nodule looks like. And pausing it here, you can see the dense tissue around the EBIS. And then you see more um, whitish tissue that could be lung. So now I know I'm in the right area because lung should look aerated and not be, not be visible very much on ultrasound and dense tissue is. So then I can put my needle in the same place that radial EBIS was and biopsy that nodule for good success. That's kind of what it looks like. You can see it spinning back and forth as I move it up and down. So what is, you're, you're in a bronchoscope. So you're yep. in the airway here. What's the benefit of using this versus just visualizing through a right. normal camera? Great question. So as, as you guys know, like the, the airway is like a big old oak tree, essentially. And right, you got you have a big old oak tree, two huge branches, smaller branches, 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 all the way to get to the leaves. Mm. At some point after the second or third branching, our bronchoscope just won't fit. Mm. It's too big. So I can't see these nodules. Now, those big tumors I showed you before, I can see those, obviously. But if, mm. the, if, the, if the lung nodule is six millimeters or eight millimeters, I'm not able to visualize it. So I'm kind of going by my mental map of the airways and something like this to biopsy. Because you have, it's kind of like a needle in a haystack almost. It's very challenging to uh, biopsy or to find, honestly. Okay. So this so gives me some confirmation I'm in the right spot. Yeah, so it's a it's a limitation of the current instrumentation at this point. We, we haven't Correct. gotten down to a small enough size camera and, and tools. Correct. They have some small cameras, but again, it gets so challenging to, there's hundreds of branches. So you yeah. could easily spend all day trying to get, you know, trying to find the exact tertiary, tertiary, you know, <laughs> bron uh, bronchial that you're trying to go through. Yeah. And as you mentioned, you love that the cases aren't that long. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And you don't, need, two to, hours you don't need a Foley cath during your, your procedures. No Foley's, no <laughs> nothing, man. It's great. Uh, so this is one of my favorite procedures to do. It's um, navigational bronchoscopy. You see a small nodule way out on the periphery. And just like that, using the radial EBUS, I can... I can navigate to that lesion, confirm with radial EBUS and biopsy under x-ray guidance or flora wow. or fluoroscopic guidance. There's a bunch, a bunch of different companies that have these lung GPS kind of situations. Some use electromagnetic fields, some use uh, shape sensing technology. Essentially, so you have a nodule somewhere, right? And you use a computer software that digests the, the, the CAT scan that you feed it, tells you where the nodule is and kind of a good mapping to get there. Use that mapping and your and your mind to kind of get there. And once you're there, you can biopsy for and hope for a diagnosis. Traditionally, our yield was around 73%, but now with newer technologies I'm about to talk about, our yield is drastically increased. That's awesome. And, and I just hope, like I, I'm adding all the humor here. Like I, I hope if you go down the wrong way, you have to back up. You're like redirecting, redirecting. 100%. <laughs> so yeah, I, I kind of wish there'd be you no know, be like turn left. Here, turn right at the second. In like Mr. Line. T's voice. Yeah, <laughs> you can get Morgan Freeman or somebody. Yeah, <laughs> very calming and soothing. So uh, yeah, it's a good case. Uh, so you can see here, you can appreciate a nodule here, and you see a large airway going straight to it. This will be the you know your chip shot, perfect navigational case, right? You go through that airway, and here it looks so easy, but really this is a fourth or fifth airway. You really have to kind of be cognizant wow. to get there. So this is the newest kind of technology, the new hotness that we have, robotic bronchoscopy. It essentially is by a different bunch of different companies, but like just like a robotic surgery, we can have robotic bronchoscopy. It navigates better. It's thin. It gets really far out, all the way, all the way to, the end, to the end of the lung, essentially. And it's very stable. It stays where you aim it. So you can put a bunch of tools through there and it won't change its, its, um, its trajectory too much because if you're aiming yeah. at eight millimeters, a small, ang you know, a small deangulation or whatever will be very, you know, very difficult. Very, are, uh, are we to the point where kind of like Tesla full self-driving, like can, uh, can the catheters get there on their own or are you still following the map? I, I do. I do a lot. Unfortunately, I was hoping that I could one day be in my underwear at home on the couch and just rock <laughs> these patients, but not, we're not there yet. Yeah. If any company sees this, I want to be the person to try that out. Okay. <laughs> I want to be your person. <laughs> This is kind of the little thing that we use to drive the bronchoscope. It's got a little ball on the right and a, and a, and a wheel up and down. And it's got a touch screen that we can kind of see all our technology. They couldn't give you like a big 50 inch screen. So the, so <laughs> if you look on the right of these people, there is, there is a huge screen, but right, the right. control is a small little screen and you kind of look 
at the big screen while you control yeah. the small screen. Not, you can not minority away. report kind of. No, no. And, you know, there's no VR. Some people are playing with like VR and stuff, but that's probably yeah. mainstream, yeah, which would be kind of cool. So this is the planning software. Just one quick slide about this. It kind of looks pretty futuristic and kind of you plan how you want to get there, depending how you want to get there. And then you plug that plan into the robot on the day of the case and it gives you a path and you kind of make sure everything matches up. This is a uh, cone beam CAT scan. So radiology and a bunch of other services use this. We're one of the few people in our state that we're the only people in our state right now that use this technology combined with robotic bronchoscopy. What this does is it gives me real time tool and lesion confirmation. So I went with the robot, got where I think I am. I poke the needle out. I grab a quick CAT scan to make sure the needle's inside the lesion. That way, if that nodule turns out to be benign, I'm comfortable saying I was representative of that nodule. It's not like I missed. And that gives me more peace of mind when I tell my patient, listen, I really do think it's benign. I don't think it's a cancerous nodule because you never know, right? So this is a quick little video of us doing a procedure. This is me regist uh, registering the patient's airways on the right of the screen, the virtual bronch uh, bronchoscopic airways on the left. I'm driving in the left main stem to tell the robot this is the patient's actual airway. It uses the, the old plan and the new information to make a new kind of mapping, essentially. It's collecting data that's like a, a million times a second or whatever they say. Now that we've uh, registered and everything, you can see there's a little blue line right here. And that's kind of my guide, my GPS. And on the right is the patient's actual airways. And I can see they're matching up. There's an upper airway and a lower division of that airway. So then it tells me, okay, I go forward. Okay, don't go left, keep, keep straight. Now go right, now go up. And I keep going, it, it messed up for a little bit, but now it figured itself out. Keep going, keep going, go left again. You can see how many bifurcations there are, right? It's like uh, yeah. six or seven bifurcations already. And here, it, the CAT scan missed an airway, but I know from, my, from looking and reviewing the scan, I need to go straight. So I went straight, This that little blue teal ball you see on the left is our mm -hmm. virtual target which doesn't always line up, but usually it's pretty accurate. Then what I'll do is I'll get a, a CAT scan of the patient after I deployed my needle to see if the lesion's actually in there. And this is kind of what it looks like. You have my, my bronch, the needle coming out and everything. And then this is the virtual target that I made with the CAT scan. This is my robotic arm and there's a needle coming out of it. And I'm biopsying in real time as the patient's breathing. And this, you know, we're getting a getting a representative nodule. And then I give the slide to the pathologist next to me. He or she says, I'm in it, I'm not in it, you missed, whatever. And I can keep readjusting as needed to get the answer. So this in is a this, cool case. Uh, sorry, the, the, the patient is under general at this Absolutely. point? Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. that's one of the other the, the drawbacks. <clears throat> it's the under general anesthesia because if you're going after an eight millimeter nodule, they can't be coughing, they can't be moving, mm -hmm. they can't be you know breathing too much. You want dedicated breaths every single time that are expected. That way I can aim as accurately as possible. Uh, also, at the same time, we do an EBUS, so we, we diagnose the lung cancer and stage the lung cancer in one procedure instead of two or three, depending nice. on the modalities. So I, I, I like it because it's a one-stop shop. It helps the patient. It's one charge instead of charging the patient with two different you know, uh, services. This is a patient we did a couple of weeks ago, actually. You can see where the big arrow is. This is a nine or 10 millimeter perifissural pulmonary nodule. Usually, traditionally, they teach you these nodules are likely benign when they're sitting on the fissure. They're usually pulmonary uh, lymph nodes or something. This had been growing, and she's a chronic smoker, had high risk factors for lung cancer. So we took her for uh, robotic bronchoscopy with cone beam CT. I navigated as best I could to that lesion, and I stuck my needle out. And this is the axial view of the CAT scan. You can see my needle is just superior to that nine millimeter lesion, and I thought I was there. I was getting a decent radial EBUS image, but you know things deflect or what have you. So I ended up re-navigating or just all I did was I kind of decreased the robotic arm a few degrees. And then I, re, re, I did another CAT scan. You can see here the needles inside the lesion. I got center strike and I'm comfortable if this is non-malignant then I was actually representative of the lesion. It's kind of what it looks like. This is a radial EBUS image on the bottom left after I re-navigated. So it's, I'm, I'm inside the lesion. That's the robotic arm under fluoroscopy. This was actually um, adenocarcinoma. And because it was so early stage, you can get resected, go to surgery and be cured rather than waiting too large. If it gets larger, because you know, we can't buy it. Because now, now that we can biopsy these smaller nodules, we're able to catch cancer earlier rather than waiting for it to grow even further to be able to biopsy these things.
So I, I, I think it's so cool. It's my favorite thing procedures to do. It's satisfying. And if you find cancer like this, it's cured, it's curative, right? They go to surgery and that's it. It's awesome. We yeah. also did an EBIS and the tumor had not spread. So she was a candidate for surgery. That's great. All right, and some of the things in the future, uh, more one-stop shop type stuff. Essentially, we do the same thing. We diagnose the nodule. Pathology says it's cancerous. We stage the mediastinum. The mediastinum is negative. Then if it's negative, we can, and if they're not a surgical candidate, if they're old or have bad lungs, we can just zap the tumor, essentially. That's not here yet, but there are a lot of trials and a lot of expert places doing that. And hopefully in the next five years, it will become more commonplace. So really diagnosis, staging, and treatment in the same anesthetic event, which would be awesome. Yeah, be very that's cool. really cool. One last thing, the last thing I'm going to talk about, this is a one of the most advanced things, I guess, the extent of interventional pulmonology. It's almost encroaching on thoracic surgery. It's a medical thoracoscopy. Essentially, it's, a, it's essentially a surgical procedure. We do these under conscious sedation. We don't do them under general anesthetic. And uh, we don't, we kind of make a small entry into the pleural cavity. We take a look around, sample pleural fluid, sample pleural, uh, the pleural lining or pleura to get diagnosis and, and, and make patients feel better. So there are a lot of different indications for this. Uh, biggest stuff is concern for uh, occult cancer that you're not able to, to diagnose with just uh, pleural fluid sampling alone. Mesothelioma, uh, chronic infections, empyema, things like these are our tools. The left is a rigid uh, thoracoscope and the right is a flexible one. It's a video of us going through the pleural, into, through the chest into the pleural space. I think this is done during fellowship as well. It stutters, I remember that stuttering. Uh, so this is, you have here, the uh, straight ahead of you is the lining of the the, um, the pleura. On the bottom is kind of the lung and the diaphragm, and to the left is a very abnormal looking pleural nodule right there that we're going to sample at some point. So we do a quick airway exam, or sorry, a pleural exam. So I used to saying that. Uh, there's a diaphragm on the left, kind of you can see it breathing up and down, some nodularity on the diaphragm. And then we look to the right, there's a lung beneath you. Right, that is all long down there. And then we look at the apex to make sure there's no obvious tumors or things like that. We saw a bunch of abnormality. The pleura should be nice and smooth. So I can go farther to where, let's see some adhesions. And now we'll take some forceps. We find the area that's safe to biopsy. So we don't want to get any vessels or nerves or anything. Um, this one looks more satisfactory. Try to get a full thickness biopsy. And after, after the biopsy, we send that to pathology. This was actually follicular uh, lymphoma. He had no other areas of disease. It's very interesting. Usually it presents somewhere else. And then the patient goes home either the same day or keep him for a night in the hospital. Usually it's well tolerated. We give him a pain control and that's it. And they under conscious sedation, so they're not actually don't have you know, an airway. So it's kind of the end of it. I know it's a, a little bit longer than I wanted it to be, but there's something awesome. you kind of, it may have made her, you know, it, it uh, made your, Decision or broke your decision? You want to be an interventional <laughs> pulmonologist? I don't know. <laughs> you could be like, "This is awesome," or be like, "No, actually, you know, nephrology is a little better." <laughs> yeah, I prefer that. But I mean, we, you know, we have a lot of cool tools. We do a ton of procedures. It's I feel on the cutting edge of technology. We're doing a lot of cool things with robots and CAT scans and things like that. And there's a lot of opportunities for research trials. I mean, a couple of research trials right now that are for kind of more experimental procedures and things like that. For these patients yeah. That's so really I, I post my stuff on twitter sometimes and uh linkedin as well if i can get around i'm not, I'm not the best person with social media but if you want to follow me that's fine too <laughs> you <can do laughs> fire, that firing lasers <laughs> that's right you can see some <laughs> lasers in real time um uh, we got time for one maybe two questions if you have a question want to raise your hand we'll uh allow you to speak <laughs> uh here we go Diana here. Hello. Hey, what's going on? Thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciate it as I have never seen anything like this before. So it was a very <laughs> nice introduction and very in-depth. And I could see you took your time making the presentation. So thank you very much for that. Sure. Um, I, I had a curiosity as to um, earlier in the presentation, you had um, you had shown us a few pictures of uh, of the of the lungs. I don't know if you call those like CTs or radiographies, but um, you had mentioned that one of your patients was breathing better. 
um this was on slide 23 but the the one that you had mentioned if if i if i heard correctly was the lung on the far right which is um which i believe i heard was a collapsed lung so how Correct. can yeah so how can a collapsed lung that's where i i'm very curious how can a collapsed lung help a patient breathe better how does it work yeah uh, that's a great question so i think collapsed lung by the general term is a little confusing. Sometimes the lung can be collapsed from air into the pleural space, making that lung squish or collapse from pleural fluid being in the pleural space, again, making that lung squish. And that obviously will not make you breathe better. This was a targeted intentional collapse, selective collapse of that right upper lobe. And because the patient has way too much lung for their chest, the problem with emphysema is that you end up getting what we call trapped air. Air gets inside the lung, but it's not able to be breathed out as easily. So if you all kind of take a deep breath, breathe out halfway, stop, take a deep breath again, breathe out halfway, stop, take a deep breath again, you'll find that you're not able to take a full deep breath. And that's kind of mm -hmm. how these COPD years live. Oh. If I'm able to get some of that air out, you're able to exhale fully and take a, a deeper breath. Now there is some sacrifice of lung tissue that is not participating in gas exchange, but because mm -hmm. you're, you're improving the, uh, the, the respiratory mechanics so much more, they usually end up being beneficial and they feel better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else have a question? Uh, time for one more. Yeah, one guy in the chat said, the one way vow is to let air out and not in. Yes. So the air comes out of the lung, out of the and out of your mouth, right? But air does not go back in. That way, every time they exhale, that lung will slowly, slowly collapse and get squished, and no more air will be in there. And it'll take up less volume in the chest, and the the other the healthier lung can able to is able to expand, and the diaphragm can can work a little better. Because rather the diaphragm is like squished against a wall by all that lung, so it can't really move left or right or up or down. When you squish that, when you collapse that lung or cause selective atelectasis, is a real good term for it, that diaphragm can relax more and then it can actually breathe better like this rather than like this. That makes more yeah. sense. You know? Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on again. Uh, your Twitter is there. Your LinkedIn <laughs> is there. Um, Dr. Ramsey Abdelghani, thank you so much for taking some time. Uh, amazing presentation, lots of cool stuff. And I hope everyone goes to bed tonight just thinking about playing Halo and shooting lasers and going pew, 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 pew to get to help people breathe better and not That's shooting right, holes in them. Yeah, this is, this is really <laughs> fun. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, man, I'm going to go to sleep tonight. I got cases tomorrow. I'm there excited. you go. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, thank you again, Ramsey. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, guys.